again, everybody, and welcome to Big Blue Kickoff Live. This is Tuesday's edition here on Giants.com. I'm Paul Dottino at Giants WFAN. He is Super Bowl champion Howard Cross at Howard Cross 87. And we'll be here for the next hour to talk Giants football and maybe a couple other NFL things if you'd like to throw that in there as well. Our phone number to dial is 201-939-4513, 201-939-4513. But first up, we continue our summer preview of the Giants opponents this season. Ooh. And wouldn't you know it, Howard, you're the lucky man because you happen to be in on a week where we will be talking about the New York Jets. Oh, the Giants no. will be playing the Jets on the 29th of October here at MetLife Stadium. And to join us is Dan Leberfeld, the publisher of Jets Confidential, who has covered the Jets for a long, long time. We talk all the time about me being old, covering the Giants for 41 <laughs> years. Dan, I don't know how many years it's been with you and the Jets now, but uh, I think that number's getting up there. Yeah, we might be in the, in the same uh, stratosphere there. Yeah, it has been a long time. And uh, you know what? But like you, I like to – I mean, Howard will never lose his passion for football. But, you know, sometimes – Sports writers get a little worn out and jaded. Uh, both of us, I think we're still into it, Paul. The fire continues to burn. And, Dan, thank I, I, you so much for yeah, being with I, us. Yeah, I know Paul does. You ought to see him on the sideline. He goes crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm well aware of that. <laughs> so, so Dan, I mean, let, let, let's let just start with the big elephant in the room. What have you seen so far from Aaron Rodgers? Uh, we know that, you know, he did report on time. He has done all the things that the Jets asked him to do. He finally got out of that, that dark room that he was in when he was still a Green Bay Packer. Uh, your thoughts this? at this point on what we will expect to see from him once they get to training camp? Well, he left the dark room, and then he started drinking that tea that we hear so much about, the, uh, the mushroom tea, whatever that <laughs> is. So it, it's uh, one holistic thing after the other, but whatever works for him. But when you look at Aaron Rodgers, one of the biggest things for the Jets and just a boon to the whole operation was the fact that he participated in their spring practices following the trade on April 24th. As we know, the last couple of years in Green Bay, he did not participate mm -hmm. in the spring aside from the mandatory minicamp. And just watching him out there, getting on the same page with the Jets receivers like Garrett Wilson and moving guys around the practice field like pawns on a chessboard, that is so huge. And Howard knows that being in, uh, in so many offenses over the years as far as these guys getting on the same page with Aaron Rodgers as opposed to Aaron Rodgers waiting till training camp you know, showing up in late July and then starting the clock on getting on the same page. That work in the spring is huge, and I think it'll benefit the Jets in camp and when the season starts. Wow, that's that sounds great. You know, I kind of expected that from from Aaron. I thought he would do everything he had to do to get in there. Now, my question wouldn't be so much about Aaron, but who's going to protect Aaron? Looking at the tackles themselves, they've been injured a lot. I mean, just they haven't had a had a good go at it. What what do you expect from the tackles this year? Yeah, Dwayne Brown uh, was. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't know if he won that Ed Block Award, but he certainly should. I don't recall who won it, but mm -hmm. uh, he played. He missed the first month after separating his shoulder in training camp, and then Dwayne Brown, the veteran left tackle, played twelve games with the shoulder strapped in with a harness mm -hmm. every Sunday, and he played fairly well. He didn't give up a lot of sacks. I mean, he wasn't as good as he might have been without the shoulder problem, but he was still solid. So he should be the left tackle. So that means Makai Becton will play right tackle. We all know he doesn't really want to play there. Mm -hmm. But after essentially missing the last two years, I don't really know if he's got a seat at the table deciding where he's going to play. And the other thing is, even if he's a little disgruntled about it, he doesn't have a choice but to play great. He's in a contract year. They didn't pick up his fifth-year option. Whether he's mad at the Jets about right tackle or not, he needs to go out there and kick butt. And now that he, uh, you guys know this place so well, uh, worked out of Parisi this offseason, mm -hmm. got his weight down. Uh, he's in the 350 area, and if he could stay healthy, remember that right knee has given out two years in a row. Yep. I think the, the, the less weight will help him deal with that, but we'll see how that holds up. But if he can hold up, he could be a really good right tackle. He's like built to play right tackle in terms of being a road grader and getting a lot of push in the run game. 
I want to stay with the offensive line, Dan, because I truly believe the Jets have a very solid roster and a lot of pieces that they can be pleased about. But to me, it is that offensive line. You know, it always comes back to that in football 101. The offensive line is the root of everything. And they're going to go probably with Joe Tipman, the rookie, who they drafted this year in the second round. The Giants, of course, are doing the same thing with John Michael Schmitz. Mm -hmm. The Jets wound up with Tipman. These were supposed to be the two best centers in this year's draft. Uh, What did you see from him so far in the spring? Because, as I say, if this offensive line does not progress, it could mean some trouble. Yeah, you know, as you guys know, it's hard to really evaluate offensive linemen in the spring with Mm -hmm. such limited contact. But the one thing you do notice about him, whether there are pads or no pads, is even though he's a 6'6", 300-pound center, he does a very good job staying low. That's probably why you don't see a lot of 6'6 centers because, you know, the pad level's too high for that position. But he works very hard at it. He worked under Jason Fabini, the former Jets tackle, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. That was like his mentor. Mm -hmm. So he is, you know, he was trained and groomed to play in the NFL. Then he goes to Wisconsin, an offensive line factory. So he should be really good. I don't know who the week one start will be. Tittman will start eventually, Paul. But Connor McGovern's a pretty good center. And, Howard, you know how this stuff works when you – you, you sign with a team, and then they draft a player at your position in the draft. You're like, maybe I should have waited. Because Connor McGovern literally signed a week or two before the draft re-signed, and then they picked Tittman. And he's not going to say anything, but I'm sure he's probably thinking, you know, maybe I should have waited. <laughs> he, he probably is, but he's a veteran. So, you know, you, you when you're doing that and you sign with a team, you're probably thinking to yourself, I can get this done. I'm like, I got, I'm not giving up my spot, but – I don't know how today's NFL work all, all the time, but I think they put the best players on the field. Curious one more time about the tackles. Forgive me. Who's the backup if you know Beckham goes Beckham goes down? Well, they have a few backups. Uh, they have Billy Turner. Remember the infamous Aaron Rodgers wish list from the spring. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> his name wasn't his name wasn't publicized, but I'm sure he was on it. He played with Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay from 2019 to 2021. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever interviewed him along the way. Extremely cerebral guy. Can play anywhere on the line. Uh, knows the offense. So he's a backup tackle guard um, when you look at him. And then Max Mitchell, who they picked in the fourth round last year at a uh, University of Louisiana, the former Louisiana Lafayette, he, played, he started some games last year. And then he hurt his knee, and then he had an issue with blood clots, and they shut him down. He's healthy now. Up, so he's also – He's also in the mix uh, at tackle, and, and there's some. Well, do we lose you? Uh, Greg Sanat out of Wagner, who is a basketball player that I'm sure Paul Dettino called his games. Yes, I did. Uh, yeah, really athletic. I mean, this guy, you know, you always hear about the basketball player going off into tackle, mm-hmm. and you think he's going to have the light on his feet thing going on. He is like that. He's bounced around a little bit, but maybe at this point, after, you know, becoming more comfortable in his football skin, he could do something because I know it's a long shot for him, but, man, is he light on his feet. Nice, nice. One more question here. I have to ask a question about a Bama guy. Tell me what's going on with Quentin. <laughs> he went right well, to the defense. <laughs> well, the thing about that is, and I'm very much in the minority here, I believe he should get paid very well. Don't get me wrong. But the thing is, uh, when you look at Dexter Lawrence and you look at Jeffrey Simmons and and – these are guys that you can't run on up the middle. Quinnen Williams is a heck of an interior pass rusher with that first step quickness to beat the guards and centers into gaps and had 12 sacks this year. However, guys like that, and Ed Oliver is similar in Buffalo, and he got paid, but he got $17 million a year, not $23 million a year. Ed Oliver is another guy, 280, jumps the gaps, great quickness, but can get engulfed against the run. And it's not Quinnen's fault. It's not a toughness thing. I'm not dissing your Alabama guy, Howard. You did the thing bit. is, <laughs> no, but, but I'd love to hear I'm what joking. you have to say about this, Howard, because he gets, it's not his fault, but he's very, uh, I wouldn't say uh, light. I mean, 280, 290 pounds and light, not light for an average human being, but he's not, he doesn't have a lot of that thickness that a Jeffrey Simmons or a Dexter Lawrence has. So, Jets have had issues with run defense up the middle. So the question is, what do you pay a guy who's a superb interior pass rusher, a defensive tackle, but struggles against the run a little bit because of his size? Uh, that, that I don't know. I don't know the number of what, what the marks are in, in the league right now, but I don't think he's going to get top dollar. I think 
when you think of a guy that size, you think more of Aaron Donald. Uh, that's the size, and everybody's trying to find the next Aaron Donald to make that play to be that guy. Aaron Aaron's able to anchor down in the middle and, and take on the double teams and stop the run. But, you know, when you're making that first quick move to jump, and if you jump and guess wrong, You'll be in a you'll be in a bad spot. <laughs> just that's yeah, and that's the issue, and that's the issue. That's an issue the Jets had. I know you guys want to get to the defense. Their run defense up the middle during that six game losing streak at the end of the year was not very good. No, and that problem that I just talked about it wasn't just Quinn and Williams. It was some other guys. They love getting those smaller, quicker defensive tackles. And like we said, you know, in the last few minutes, if they don't jump the gaps and guess right. You can run up the middle on the Jets. That's why they signed Big Al Woods from Seattle, mm-hmm. who's an immovable object at 340 pounds, the former Tennessee volunteer, because they know they got to do something about that. All right. Now, before Howard called the defensive audible, we got to finish the offense. Go ahead, go ahead. We know the weaponry they've got in the passing game. Rodgers certainly has some targets to throw to, familiar names, guys who can make plays. There's no question about that. My question for you, Dan, is – We know that Brees Hall is coming off a very serious injury. Michael Carter's a good rotational back, and Abadikanda was an interesting draft pick that they took out of Pitt this year in the fifth round. If Hall cannot give them the kind of stuff that he showed before he got hurt last year, do they have enough in the running game to maintain some balance? Yeah, it's a good question because there's a player that they like to use in their rotation the last couple years, Ty Johnson, who is a former draft pick in Detroit who they claimed on waivers, and he really carved the niche with the Jets. He was released in the spring. I love this term non-football injury, when you're working out for football, but it's a non-football injury. <laughs> he tore his pec in the weight room. We've heard that a million times. Mm-hmm. So he so he got waived. Uh, so their depth in that room is not what it could have been if Ty Johnson was there, a player they really liked. You know, Bonaconda's a rookie. We'll see what he can do. And Brees Hall, I don't know what to expect early in the year. That's why you're hearing these Dalvin Cook rumors. The Jets are interested. But what Dalvin Cook is finding out, he's obviously an outstanding player. You guys uh, have covered games with him the last few years. Outstanding player. However, you know how tough it is for running backs, and especially right before training camp where nobody has any cap space. So there's interest in Dalvin Cook, but not at what he's asking right now. How about guys like Zeke Elliott? Yeah, that's a possibility, too. Uh, You know, that's a guy that they would certainly consider. But once again, the problem is for guys like Zeke Elliott and Dalvin Cook, who are used to making really good money, and rightfully so, because they're very talented, it's very hard in your late 20s to say, you know what, I'm going to play for a one-year, $3 million deal. Howard, you know how tough that is for guys used to a certain pay level. I wish I did. (laughs) <laughs> no, no, I meant covering it. I meant covering it, not experiencing okay, it. Covering it, yeah, I got it. Yeah, covering it. My bad, my bad. Uh, we should just touch on the receivers again. Wilson, Lazard, Davis, Mims. Uh, there's there's some talent there. Now, if those guys stay they healthy. A, do and, they have a tight end on the team? Well, I guess, I guess Conklin's the starter, right, Dan? <laughs> yeah, Conklin, Uzama. Uzama's a Howard Cross kind of tight end, you know, 6'6" about 270, like having an extra offensive tackle out there. And one of the reasons Uzama, the former Bengal, didn't catch a lot of passes last year was because they had so many issues at tackle with injuries that he had to stay in a lot. Mm-hmm. So, And Conklin was kind of the move H-back, and he was a very nice addition for them last year. Former college basketball player before transiting to football, so he goes up and high points the ball nicely. Let's go back to defense. You talked about the rush defense. How much does C.J. Mosley have left? Well, Todd. That's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a good transition from tight ends because the Jets have got to do a better job covering tight ends, especially in the division they're in. When you look at, think about this division now. In um, New England, you have Hunter Henry and Mike Gesicki. Mm-hmm. And obviously Buffalo Dalton Kincaid in the first round, mm-hmm. and Dawson Knox. Mm-hmm. Jets have not been great in coverage. And C.J. And, and Mosley, the instincts are there. Very smart player. He knows where to go, but you know maybe he doesn't have the wheels he used to. So he's covering a tight end of 4-5 speed. It's not a lack of effort. It's just a lack of you know maybe not having the speed to keep up if the pass rush doesn't get there. So they've got to do a much better job covering the tight ends. And it's interesting Quinn and Williams' brother, Quincy Williams, is a linebacker for the Jets, as you know. Mm-hmm. And he runs like 4-5. He's got great wheels. He's a big-time run support guy. You know, he really plays tough, loves football. 
one pass defense last year. That is a very strange stat for a four or five linebacker who's in coverage a lot. No picks, one PD. Well, you watched I mean, him, what Dan. What do you guys think of that you, stat? You, you watched him. Why do you think? The problem is the Jets play this system where, you know, it, it comes from that old Seattle Legion of Boom. That's where Robert Sala, mm-hmm. you know, worked for a long time under Pete Carroll. And Jeff Ulbrich, the defensive coordinator, has experience in that system because he worked under Dan Quinn in Atlanta. They love to run to the ball. Very, very aggressive. That's why they rotate their defensive tackles so much, because they ask them to run to the sideline more than a lot of other schemes. So when you're that aggressive, you guys know, when you're that aggressive, you're more apt to bite on play fakes and, and, and you know get out of position. And I think that's a big problem with Quincy Williams. He's so tough and so aggressive. And he, he hits people in a way that inspires his teammates. However, with that aggressive style, sometimes he's – uh, biting on things and, and in coverage, guys are getting behind him. So he, he doesn't have a lot of recognition is what you're saying. You're, you're saying that they're running plays. He's not recognizing the play. So, you know, that's a hard thing for a linebacker. If you don't have great play recognition and know, you know, ahead of time what's coming at you when you're looking at the, the formations and who's coming out, you're going to have a hard time in the pass game. And you can you can fool a lot of guys with that. Yeah, and that's the problem. It's like, you know, you think about the, the linebackers with the incredible instincts like, Luke Keekly and the way they trigger and the way they see things. And it's just not something you can teach. And Quincy gives it everything he's got. I just don't know if his coverage instincts will ever allow him to be a top shelf cover guy. The run support is amazing. Maybe the coverage will improve a little bit this year with what they hope is a better pass rush. We all know Howard and Paul that you, no matter who the linebacker is, you can't ask these guys to hold up for six seconds with no pass rush. Mm -hmm. There are very few that can do it. What what happens is most of the time with defenses, and I know Sal is probably thinking about this. If, if you can stop the run and plug the run, the linebackers kind of fill the plays. If they have to come up and make the play every time, then they get themselves out of play for play action passes and all everything. That, that's what you're talking about. And when you describe what, what was happening with Quentin in the middle, if you got guys coming free in the middle, you got to come up and fill with with the linebacker. You're going to be able to throw the top a lot right right where they left. Mm-hmm. That's a great point. <laughs> Let's talk secondary for a second, Dan. It all starts with Charles Gardner. Obviously, the guy was sensational as a rookie. I'm sure he'll continue to get better. But I'm interested a little bit in Chuck Clark, who comes over from Baltimore. Guy's been a starter now for a handful of years in this league, and he's been productive. How will he fit into what they want to do in the defensive backfield? Well, it's going to be tough because uh, he, he seemed to suffer a knee injury in the spring so his availability might be in question and if he can't play and it doesn't look it looks like it's long term so mm. uh, that's on a, it, there hasn't been a lot of information out there about it because it's the spring and you know you don't report injuries but if he can't go they got a problem because uh the guy who started last year uh back there in that position was lamarcus Joyner, and he's not back uh, i think he might be retired at this point so chuck clark was brought in to fill that spot. Uh, Whitehead is the other safety. Whitehead is another guy, big thumper against the run, but you know sometimes in coverage is, is a tick late reacting to certain things. So he's got to work on that. So Chuck Clark, the cerebral veteran, had a solid career in Baltimore, gets everybody lined up. That's a big loss. So they signed Adrian Amos recently, the former Packer, former Penn State player, mm-hmm. to – uh, help them at the safety position, but he was not there the whole spring because they, they thought Chuck Clark was going to be the guy. So the corner should be fine. That that duo is is really good with Sauce Gardner and DJ Reed. Safety right now, a lot of question marks. Seems like you guys got some injuries a lot of places on on both sides of the ball. What what's the outcome of that? I mean, what's what's going to happen? Are they going to be ready for the first of the year? Are they going to be ready for training camp? Like what's going on? Yeah. Um, that, that's tough to tell. You know, it's, the Jets spent a lot of money, like a lot of teams, a couple of years ago, and they developed this sports science department and th- with a lot of new people. A lot of they're in front of their names uh, in that new department. But you know what, Howard? As you know firsthand, there are a lot of injuries you can't prevent. You know, what's Brees Hall going to do in conditioning to prevent blowing out his knee cutting? Uh, you know, and, and the same thing with Chuck Clark, who, who we'll see what happens there, but he hurt his knee in the spring. What are you going to do about that stuff? So 
everybody's so fast to blame the old trainer or the old doctor or whoever, <laughs> but how much is it really the doctors and the trainers and how much is it just playing a very violent sport called football? Yeah, that's for sure. It's a little different. I, I tell people all the time, though, I think I think the main thing that's happened to players, uh, unfortunately, is that uh, without the contact, I know they were trying to save contact to try to, quote, unquote, keep them safe and keep them healthy, but it's like boxing. If you don't spar, it's hard to fight. <laughs> so that's <laughs> you've seen a lot more injuries these last few years. The more the, the less they practice, the less contact you see, the more soft tissue injuries you see. Dan, final question before we let you go, and we appreciate your time. You've been very generous with us. A couple of former Jets are now here with the Giants, Jeff Smith, Jamison Crowder. Of course, we know what Crowder did with Washington, used to slice the Giants to ribbons. <laughs> Your thoughts on what they may bring to the Giants' table as they fight for a, a roster spots here during the, the summer camp? Well, uh, to start off, two high-character guys, two hard-working guys, two guys you really want in your locker room. As far as Jamison Crowder, interesting segue from the soft tissue uh, stuff Howard was talking about. Jamison Crowder is a heck of a player, but he's had so many hamstrings and groin type things. Not his mm. fault. And, you know, when you cut as quick as he does, that probably contributes to it. So the only issue with Jamison Crowder is not ability. It's not route running. It's not his hands. It's those soft tissue injuries which keep rearing their head. I mean, you guys could you know, look up the numbers at some point in terms of how many games he's missed. I don't like to disrespect players about missing games. He doesn't want to miss games, but for some reason there's been some soft tissue issues. But gets open real quick. Your, your typical you know, guy you'd expect in terms of an, an elite slot receiver who just uncovers very fast. Jeff Smith, really good special teams player, but underrated receiver. I know it's going to be hard for him. The Giants have a pretty loaded receiver room to get on the field, but when he was called upon with injuries at receiver, he always did a solid job for the Jets. How much special teams do you think that they will count on him for? Because what he signed here, that's what we heard, is that you know he's got some special teams capability, and that may wind up being his best ticket to making this 53. Yeah, I mean, that was his ticket to making the Jets. We all know those guys on the bubble. Special teams can be such a tiebreaker. Though you wonder with the, the new kickoff rule if, if that'll change things a little bit, mm -hmm. but we'll see where that goes. But uh, when you look at... Uh, Jeff Smith, just a really, you know, he was a guy at Boston College who bounced around different positions. You know how they say with recruits coming out of high school, athlete, like that category? Mm -hmm. He was kind of that guy that, it, not your typical Boston College recruit, because they usually don't get, I'm not trying to disrespect <laughs> BC, but they don't get those 4-3 guys. They got right. like, they always have the corn-fed linemen right there. They always have the massive linemen. But in terms of skilled players with great speed, not something you see at a BC a ton. But this, then again, they had a first-round pick uh, for the Ravens this year. So once in a while, they get one. But when you look at Jeff Smith, really fast, very quick, very smart, and good on all the special teams. So I do think that he'll have a big role on specials for the Giants. That is Dan Leberfeld. He is the publisher of Jets Confidential. You can also catch him on Sirius XM NFL Radio on Saturdays. Uh, always enjoy a, a few minutes tuning into you on that show, Dan. And we appreciate your time so much today. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Anytime, guys. Be well. Dan Leberfeld from Jets Confidential uh, giving us the lowdown on what's going on down the turnpike, or I guess it's more like the parkway, yep. uh, down at uh, Florham Park where the Jets are holding uh, their training camp. They'll be returning. Their players will be coming back in another couple of weeks or so, just like the Giants will. And, you know, Howard, I, I get the sense <laughs> from talking to Dan, and maybe you'll agree or maybe you won't, that uh, – you know, this is not a rite of passage to the Super Bowl like so many people have written. Aaron Rodgers comes in the trade, and so many people already seem to think, well, the Jets are at least a couple of playoff rounds uh, going into the potential Super Bowl contending ship. I got the impression from talking to Dan, he sees enough awards on this team that he's a, he's a little bit concerned. Well, what he did was he he, he threw flowers at, at, at Rodgers, you know, how he moves the offense around, getting everybody in, in there to play, showing up early. He's doing all the right things. Okay, who's going to protect him? Well... <laughs> <laughs> what about what about oh, Quentin Williams? What are you gonna do with him? Well, it's like there's a lot of wells. He's in there. got some issues there. Yeah, it's a lot. It's pretty. It sound like it's a pretty deep well. But you know, they're they're a good team. I, I think they have a pretty solid defense as long as you're throwing the ball. He is right. They do have a hard time with the quote unquote 
run game, and, and they have to commit linebackers and safeties to that run game, which exposes them a little bit in the secondary. Not on Sauce's side, but on everything else mm-hmm. you can throw at. So there, there are some issues there. I think that you know, Salah's a good guy. I think Salah has good energy. I think Aaron's going to bring some energy, but they got to stay healthy. If they're not healthy, they're going to have a hard time. Yeah, I I do think there are some landmines here, and I've been trying to bring some of my Jets fans' friends, and there aren't many of those, but there are a few, and I try to bring them back to earth, and I say, look, this could go south in a hurry, much like the Mets in baseball. They spent all that money. They thought they were going to the World Series, and it hasn't quite worked out that way. But it's best to hear it from Dan because he's there every day. He sees it. Well, I like the fact that he said they had backups at at tackle. That that, that was the most encouraging thing, so that's going to be helpful, but – it did really, you know, guy coming off a shoulder injury, he was strapped up the whole season, mm-hmm. probably had surgery in the off season. You had Beckton moving from left to right. He's unhappy because he's moving to right, but he's got to, you know, play as hard as he can in theory uh, to quote unquote become the get paid at left. Uh, we've seen in the past, the guys don't really care about getting paid. They'll go somewhere else to try to make their money. Howard and we know firsthand yeah. <laughs> if your offensive line isn't going to row the boat, your team isn't going very far. Not offensively, not at all. All right, 201-939-4513. We've got about a half hour left on the program, and that's for you, the callers. Give us a dial at 201. A call, I should say, not a dial. you got a dial to make the call. <laughs> 201-939-4513. We've got a half hour, and we're going to try to go rapid fire to get to as many calls as we can. Don't forget... The Giants Huddle Podcast features long-form interviews with Giants players, coaches, front office staff, past and present. Don't forget, Giants uh, Huddle Podcast. It's on uh, Apple Podcast. You can leave a five-star review. That'll make everybody feel good and continue the program for many months to come. Giants season tickets, as well as single tickets, are available for the 2023 NFL season. The schedule's out. It's been out for a while. The training camp schedule's also out. I know you guys are getting psyched for Big Blue in 2023. Don't miss out to catch the Giants at MetLife Stadium this year. Visit Giants.com slash tickets to secure your seat. And, of course, if you want to try to get uh, a membership to the suites, well, you could have your thrill at being at MetLife Stadium all year round as well as the 2023 season. To learn more about exclusive member benefits, visit Giants.com slash tickets. Limited inventory is available. And finally, the Giants official connected TV streaming app is Giants TV. It brings original video content and game highlights on demand and direct to Big Blue fans. Giants TV is free on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and the Giants mobile app. Those things are out of the way, Howard. That means we get to talk to people, interact with the callers. 201 939 4513. Let's go to our first caller of the day, and that's going to be Wilson in Roxbury. You're first on BBKL. Hello. Hey, Paulie. Hey, good to hey, talk Alan. to you. Oh, how you doing? Hey, 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 guys, listen. I want to ask Howard one question because I already asked you a question while well back, Paulie. It was about when I said that uh, the Giants' first game against Dallas to me it was a it's a must win, and you and you and um, and Lance went nuts on me. And, uh, <laughs> well, you, you can't you make you, said, you can't make no, game no, no. one a must win. Come on, you no, know better no, no, than because, that. No, no, wait, hold on a minute. Because you said you said that. Uh, uh, what about if they lose against Dallas and they win the first four games? And they could be four and one, Paul. And to me, it'll still be it still feel like a hollow four and one. But I want to know that question. Real Howard, quick. help him out. I, I, that's not the way you look at it. I'm like, <laughs> no. Okay. no. I just want to beat Dallas on national television. That's, well, that's, that's, that's irrelevant. If they lose to Dallas and win the next seven games, you'd be like, oh, hollow victory. That, that, that's fandom that, no. right there. That's not, uh, that's not reality. What you want is for them to come out, I think, in the first okay. game of the season. I think you want them to play as well as they possibly can play, have a very close game, maybe even a muddy game, and have a chance to win it in the end. I don't expect right. any team to come out in their first game and blow somebody out unless they're just you know more talented. But I think the Giants will have a good run at it. Wilson, here's what I will say. 
Last year, the Giants made the playoffs with only one victory in the NFC East. That's Mm -hmm. like catching lightning in a bottle. You have to do better. You have to do better than that in your division, okay? Basically, three and three. You don't want to do any worse than three and three if you could avoid it. So I appreciate how badly you want to win in the division Mm -hmm. and you want to get off to a good start. But do not, do not kiss the season goodbye if they lose (laughs) the first game. Okay, we're just okay. trying to help you here. All right. Well, thank you, Paul. And uh, listen, I want to ask something about Jalen Hurts real quick. Yeah. Uh, listen, I mean, it has gotten to crazy status with this guy. I mean, some people have him the third best quarterback in the NFL. I mean, come on now. I mean, I, I think it's going to fall flat on his face this year. I mean, I'm hoping, I guess, hope that I really do. I think people are going to say, they're going to put like eight, nine men in the box, and they're going to say to him, you're the third best quarterback in the NFL? Okay. Beat us by throwing the ball and beat us by reading defenses. I really think that the people are, they're not gonna they're not gonna let them run around all over the place and and the, and their receivers are not gonna be like ten yards wide open like they were last year. <laughs> you you <laughs> are aware just to be devil's advocate, he's got some uh-huh. pretty darn good dangerous weapons, right? You, you do know that. He got extraordinary, well, yeah, I, extraordinarily I good receivers. <laughs> And he got, well, and he's got one of the best offensive lines in football. And I'm not a Jalen Hurts fan. Let me make that clear. I'm a, I'm, I'm but a, he had a hell of a season. I'm a Jalen Hurts fan. So let me let me explain to you who Jalen Hurts is. Just so okay. I don't want to hurt yeah. your fandom, but here's who Jalen. I don't is. like the guy, by the way. He's a kid who has gotten better every year he's played. Not 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 not, 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 in, not in the NFL his entire career, and he will go through anything and do anything for you. He's a, okay, yes. And when he plays right, ball, he just keeps growing. When you, when okay, he, even so when he does interviews, he's still growing. So I understand, Howard, I understand that. But listen, we have to – tell me something. In, listen, some of their receivers last year, they were 10 yards. I mean, any, any professional quarterback can complete a pass when your receiver is 10 yards open. Devon, I Devon mean, Devon I Tays, yeah, but Devontae Smith won right. the Heisman. I'm just saying that and, I haven't seen him. Th- I haven't seen him throw. I haven't seen him throw a tight window throw like Daniel Jones. I'm not going to compare Daniel Jones, yeah, but, but Daniel th- Jones last year he had to put the ball. It, it, he had like five inches to put I, the ball I, in. I got all that, but again, okay. De- well, Devontae uh, Smith won the Heisman. Brown is a perennial thousand yard receiver. Uh, the tight end is a great tight end. The running backs even catch the ball out of the backfield. Yeah, see, Everybody's well, getting open. Wilson, I'm Wilson, not, Wilson, I'm, no one is debating that it's easier for a quarterback when his receivers make plays for him and get open. Right. No one's debating that. But the fact okay. is the Eagles have those guys. Yeah. No, I understand In that, <laughs> They have those guys. But, 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 but defensive coordinators make a lot of money. They're not going to let them run around. They're gonna make him. They're gonna make it. If 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 he if he they nobody in, in the NFL, the NFL doesn't know yet that he can make a tight window throw. They don't know that yet. So maybe next year they're gonna say, well, you know what? Let's make him make throw tight windows. And if he if he can make it, then they'll win the game by by three touchdowns. If he can't make it, then we'll see who he truly is. That's all. All right. Thanks, the, for the, the, thanks, for, thanks guys. Thanks, go. Wilson. The only thing that's gonna stop Jalen Hurts is if, if his defense fails. If his defense starts to fail and, he, and they're asked to score like 60 points a game, now I think they can score 40, but I don't think they can score 60. I think the Eagles have done a great job drafting, uh, pulling guys together. I think they've done a great job with the, the with the whole, you know, just putting every, they've got everybody in place. They they drafted well. They got they and they got extreme depth at almost every position. Mm-hmm. I mean, they it's, they've done a good job. I mean, it's you a, can't you can't fault them for that. It's the best 53 in the conference. Roster-wise, you know, and of course we don't know what their 53 will be this year, but going in, we expect them to have the best 53. Yeah. Look, as Lance likes to say all the time, even though they've changed both coordinators, Sirianni is still back as the head coach. So Hertz has that in his favor. He's got a terrific offensive line in his favor. He's got terrific weaponry on the outside in his favor. Now, one thing that may betray him, Howard, and it could, is the fact that Sanders is no longer there the guaranteed 1,000-yard back is no longer helping out their running game. They're going to rely on a running back by committee with Swift, uh, Gainwell, Penny, and then there's always Boston Scott, the Giants killer. Now, if the running back by committee can give them enough to balance things out and to keep people honest, they'll be fine. That's not, that's not going to be a problem. But if that running game totally falls apart, 
it may be a little more interesting. The only way for that running game to fall apart is for that offensive line to start to be right break because down the and, the line is really good. Yeah, so I mean, again, it starts from the line. The line's really good. They do a really good job up front. They get things going and moving out there, and then once that happens, everything else kind of like piles on. Mm-hmm. So the, the only, like I said, the, with the Eagles, the only thing right now that could stop them is that their defense starts to falter a little bit. Because that will cause them to have to quote unquote throw the ball every time, and then you can lean on the receivers a little bit more and not worry about them running the ball every down. Yeah, they didn't have to come back very often last year, did they? No, no, no. Two zero one nine three nine four five one three is our phone number. Anthony in Smithtown. You're next on BBKL. Hello. Hey guys, how you doing? You're well. Um, how are you? First time caller. I have a, Great. Uh, I listen to you guys all the time. Um, but I, I, first off, I just want to say I'm glad you guys are finally back. Last week was a very, very long week. I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the questions I have uh, is regarding uh, Darren Waller. Um, I know he's a great, he's a great pickup. I know he's an offensive threat and everything. But what's his blocking like? Like I didn't follow a lot of the Raiders game. Is this guy is this guy a blocker? You know, can, he, can we line him up on the, along the line and depend on him to a little something, a little a little help to uh, Evan Neal? No, I mean, I mean no. I, I'm going to say he's probably an, a, the offside blocker or the guy that blocks out of the slot. He's not the potential blocker that you're going to put in there and grind it out. Uh, he, he he's just not. I mean, I, I, I've watched his whole career. I think he he'll probably get in the way a little bit and mess some guys up. But he's not the you know he's like Kelsey. Kelsey's a great player. Kelsey looks awesome. Kelsey is not driving anybody off the ball. But so pretty much when he's in when he's in the lineup, then that that's it. We the, the defense is going to know. Or we're, he's he's just no, not that, a threat. He's not going to help the line. It's just that he you know you can run the ball at him. You can run the ball at him, but he's just not going to be the guy that's going to be you know he'll be part of a double team. With right. where where he you know kind of like really leaning on the guy and trying to get him up to the second level. He's not an inline blocker. Like the tight ends today are, if you got a tight end as an inline blocker, like if you heard the Jets interview, they don't get to catch many passes because they're they're usually helping out the offensive line. And especially if there's an injury, they have to help out the offensive line. I believe last year we were begging for them to keep more tight ends in, Bellinger and everyone, because, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, Neil was like out there on one leg hobbling, and they're like, "Okay, if he's right. he's coming back, we need him to come back." He comes back like, "Oh my God, somebody's got to help that kid. He can't he can't get out of his stance half the time, or and when you change direction, he couldn't plant and go the other direction. So you needed someone to push the push the rusher over onto him so he could like maul him. But if he you know if if you wait if you want Waller to do that, I'm assuming he could do a chip block and, and bounce somebody. But I don't think he's going to be. And I'm not, you know, d- you know, saying anything bad or negative about him. I, I just don't think that's his that's his role. And it doesn't mean that when he's in the game, he's not necessarily going to be in in run plays. He's just not in the no. game, you know. During how do I say, he won't be the guy that you're running directly at every play. If you're running at him, there'll probably be somebody being pulled in his direction. You know, things like that. A- Andy Bischoff, the tight ends coach who had him in Baltimore, told me that it's not like he's he's deficient that you're not going to be able to run certain plays. You can run whatever you want because he's a good enough athlete and mm-hmm. he's big enough and strong enough that he can get in the way of guys. So, But if you're looking for that gritty guy in the line of scrimmage, that's Daniel Bellinger. Yeah. Bellinger's the, Bellinger. the guy. He's the, he's the gritty blocker of the two. That's why if they, if they go a lot of double tight end, which I think you'll see some packages with that, Bellinger's going to be the guy getting his nose dirty at the line, and Waller's going to be the guy who's going to be doing some pre pre motion, uh, you know, snap motion, and and be in the slot and the boundary and that this and that. Uh, that's how they want to create mismatches, and uh, and the Giants want to cause a lot of confusion for the defense by the way they line their guys up. And, I will say this though, yeah. and Waller and, was and oh, Bellinger is a, is a good receiver. Oh, he can do that. Yeah, so yeah, so but that he'll still be the more gritty guy if yeah, you, but, if you but, have to separate the two. Yeah. I will say this. A lot of people forget the fact that, Howard, you know this, Waller was a, a receiver at Georgia Tech. Mm-hmm. He was only converted to tight end after he got to the NFL. Don't forget that. That's why in a lot of ways people keep talking about Lawrence Cager, yeah. and they say he's in the form. He's not Darren Waller, but he's in the form of Waller because both guys converted to tight end after they got to the NFL. Yeah, I mean, the, the, and the league is just different now. They, you're looking more for guys that can – you know, get up the field and call and be nightmare and a mismatch. When you get up there, you, you're running on a safety. You're six five. He's maybe six foot tall. You're looking for more of that action in the game. 
and if you can create that, you know, those guys are invaluable. Well, that's why, like, I I really hope that Bellinger, you know, he's not, like, lost in all of this. You know, no. Like, I, think, I think he's he's dual. Like, this guy can block, this guy can catch, and I hope he's just not lost in, you know, the whole uh, idea of getting the Waller. Usually, usually the way it works is that the tight end that's the inline guy gets most of the plays. And yeah. the guy that's the, the, the move guy, the guy who catches the passes, the guy that does stuff, he'll be in the game a lot. But he's most of the plays are going to be – they're going to look like a run. They're going to look like, okay, they're running the ball, they're running the ball, they're running the ball. Uh-oh, they're throwing the ball. And and what happens is, well, I don't know exactly how these, you know, Kafka's going to do this and everything, but what's going to happen is that they're going to have to figure out a way to make it look like you're running the ball with, with Waller in the game. And as they start to do that, he'll start to catch, he'll start, he'll start to get in the rhythm of catching passes. Well, you're going to see, you know, the big differences and what we're hoping that we don't see a lot of. We're hoping we're not seeing a lot of third and seven pluses, third and eight pluses, third and nine right. pluses, right. because that's where, you know, Waller's going to be helpful. We're hoping that Waller makes his hay, you know, in the play action pass. Uh, that's where Belgian are also be making his hay. We're hoping that Waller makes his hay in the red zone because they need a big threat in the red zone. We're not hoping for him to be like the every down player. Like if Belgian. Bellinger were to go out, and then Waller had to come in and play every down. They're gonna have to change some things up, I would think. And, and again, nothing against Waller. That's just not how he was developed as a player this entire time. Yeah. And that's, not that's why happened. it'll be interesting to see if Tommy Sweeney or yeah. Lawrence Cager become the third tight end because they're two very different players. Yeah. Sweeney's more like Bellinger, and Cager's more like Waller. Yep. So right. they got to figure out which which is going to be the third. And remember this too: unlike when Howard played, no fullback. there's no fullback here anymore. No. <laughs> that's that, that's, that's not so part good. of it. So that allows you to keep the extra tight end if well, you want you know, to. With the practice squad and the way things go, they mm-hmm. should be able to keep some guys also. But it, we'll see. Thanks for the call, Anthony. Okay. Appreciate it. Yeah. P- please do call again. 201-939-4513. Before we get to our next phone call, mm-hmm. it is important, Howard. I I need to ask you this because it's certainly out there. There are reports out of uh, the Northwestern College football beat that uh, they're speculating that Mike Kafka would be an outstanding candidate to be the next head coach of Northwestern. They just fired their coach. He Mm. played there. He was a star quarterback there. Uh, He grew up in Chicago. Mm. And so some of the media from that neck of the woods is saying, boy, Kafka would be a great candidate. Now, folks, let me make something clear. No one in this building is talking about this. No one in this building is being sourced as and as anything happening. Okay. When when did they fire Northwestern's coach? This just happened uh, last twenty four hours. Oh. So so I guess what I would ask you is this. And again, none of this, to our knowledge, has a grain of salt to it. But I do think it's important to at least hypothetically say, if Mike Kafka were to decide to go back to where he's an alum. By the way, he's an alum there. So there's a lot of folks there who, who are going to really probably love to have him. If he were to go back to his alma mater, um, how do you think the Giants would deal with the offensive coordinator spot given the fact that training camp is only a couple of weeks away? Well, I think Kafka and, and you know, Coach, Coach B, you know, I think Brian could, could, could run it. I don't think it'd be a big issue to mm-hmm. call the plays and stuff. I think he would coach somebody else up, one of the quarterback coaches or something. Shea also. Tierney, the quarterback yeah, coach? He, he could help them you know, get through the process. Uh, as far as Kafka goes and everything, as a college football guy, I'll just say this. It's really hard for guys not to go back to their alma mater. But I would think that Kafka, because he's right now an offensive coordinator, is looking down the road thinking that, hey, look, I could be a head coach in this league. He went on three interviews in the last that's year. That's right. And when you say I could be a head coach in this league, that's what you, you that's what you have the you know the, the appetite for. That's what you're looking for in your career. Now a college coach, if you're a great college coach at your university and you're winning some games, that's a lifetime commitment. You know, you you could be there for life. But it's it's like I said, it, it's not I mean, and again, please no vicious tweets or anything yeah yeah We're, we are we are not saying that there's any it's crumbs not, to this it's not the sec <laughs> it's not, oh that that too <laughs> like I'm, i don't want anybody okay get mad okay at me. i got you i don't want anybody to get mad it's, at me. it's a big 10 it's a great school but it's not the sec yeah i know i get you yeah. but again it, it, folks a, to clarify we don't know if there's a shred or crumb of truth to it it's simply that the media out by northwestern is suggesting he'd be a great candidate yeah he, and he would be 
And if they could figure out, a, if they could find a way to pay him that kind of money, we're talking upwards of six, seven million dollars a year, then he would like, oh, well, you know, you dropped it. I have to pick it up. <laughs> it's like seven. <laughs> like, Is that so, how it works, Howard? Drop seven million on the floor. My bad. I get that for you. <laughs> you know, how long? Oh, seven years. Oh, let me let me pick that up. I got that. Let me put that in my pocket. Uh-oh. His wife would be like, you you said what? You said yes, right? Yeah, honey, I said yes. That's, that's the whole answer after that. <laughs> All right, we go back to the phone lines. Dave from Cranford, you're next on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hello. How are you guys? We're very well, good, Dave. How are good. you? Uh, good, man. I just want to talk a little bit about the offense. From well, that's a Evan nasty phone Atlanta. line. I think our connection's rough today. Try Dave, it. Dave, try it again, okay. Dave. Okay, can you hear me, guys? Yeah, there you go. Okay. How's that? Is that better? A little yeah. bit. Don't move wherever okay. you're at. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Dave, did we lose you? You still there? Uh, he's gone. Dave, 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 Dave the, 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 Dave our better. line, we will hold it open if you want to call us back right away. We will see if we can get a better connection with you, and we'll be very glad to take your phone call. Mm-hmm. 201-939-4513. By the way, did you get a look at the practice field? The grass is all green. It looks great. <laughs> See, that's that's like really mean because as, as many people suffering from that rainstorm that we just had. Oh, it's, 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 that's I'm why sorry. it's so green. <laughs> well, this <laughs> boy has been raining around here. Well, they thatched, you know, they thatched about two or three weeks ago, and it was all brown. But yeah. Rob Davis, the grounds uh, keepers, uh, di- the groundskeeping director here, mm-hmm. has done a marvelous job with these fields. And when you guys come out for training camp, you'll see it. Okay, okay. As long as, long as it's not underwater. No, that's for sure. Like that. And by the way, you see all the, see all the bleachers are up. Yep. With I the canopies, seen. everybody's getting ready. They're ready to go. Anyway, 201-939-4513 <laughs> is our number here on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Again, the Giants will open the season, uh, the preseason, on August 11th in Detroit against mm-hmm. the Detroit Lions. Mm-hmm. But until then, they got a few weeks of uh, training camp, and we're all looking forward to seeing these guys on the field. One thing I will say during the course of the uh, early summer and late, uh, or late spring drills, we saw guys on the side, uh, Robinson, Ashawn Robinson, Wandale Robinson, Sterling Shepard, uh, Darren Beavers, Aaron Robinson – all of those guys were doing a lot of stuff with the trainers and really didn't do a whole lot else. So it will be very interesting to see how much they're allowed to do once training camp starts. I think all of them certainly are pup possibilities, okay. but we'll have to see what the trainers decide to do with them. Right. Let's go back to the phones. Uh, Dave in Cranford is going to try it one more time. Hi, Dave. Hey, Paul. Hey, how are you guys doing? That much better. better. Much, much better. better. Oh, you thanks. fixed the battery. Uh, you sound like a different <laughs> you guys, person. <laughs> You guys are the best. Thanks so much. Hey, real quick, I just want to talk about the offensive line. Um, I think it always comes back to that, when it, when it, uh, particularly with this offense this year. Um, particularly, I, I just have to say, I'm super impressed listening to Evan Neal. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, look, I, I get that these guys get coached and know what to say or how to say stuff, but his interviews, man, like, and, and you know, he's had to answer some tough questions because last year didn't go the way that he wanted. Um, and he's really handled it really well and, like, you know, been very balanced, you know, took a lot of accountability, like, for for his play. He just comes across as a guy, and I I know it's not enough, but it it says something that really cares and wants to get better. And and as a fan, like, that's one of the biggest things you want to see is that these guys actually – sounds funny to say, but they, they, they actually care. And, you know, I, I really have high hopes for him. He looks like he's in great shape. He's, he's addressed some of the stuff in the offseason. He could have just, you know, done whatever in the offseason. Um, he obviously didn't, and he's, you know, coming back. And, and I think he's, you know, obviously I think he's like a critical piece to how the offense is going to function. So love to get you guys' thoughts on him and just overall how you think that fits. Thanks, Dave. Well, it came from a you know great university. Uh, All right, you want <laughs> you, you want you want me to do it for you? No, no, no. Okay, go ahead. Roll tide. There you go. <laughs> no, but. All jokes aside, first round pick, you get drafted that high. The kid's a phenomenal athlete. Uh, again, getting into the league the first year, you're getting away from the quote unquote Alabama or I guess any college football. In college football, you're allowed to practice. 
you're allowed to put on pads. You're allowed to work on your skill. You like to work at a, at a high rate of pace. You see, quote unquote, full speed plays a lot in practice. Uh, sometimes it's ones on ones. They do a lot of a lot of hardcore drills, and then you get out and you come into the league. You come to the league, you get seven padded practices during the year. Mm-hmm. That's a big change. Mm-hmm. That's a huge change. And I'm, like, I, I, I keep making references to it. I'm not a doctor, so don't nobody jump on me about that. No sparring, harder to fight. And that's the, the group that suffers the most are the offensive linemen. And let's not forget, he has even made mention of this, so it's not like we're pulling it out of thin air. He did have to switch back from the left side to the right side again. Yeah. And he said it was an adjustment. Yeah, but it's an adjustment. The whole getting down, getting used to getting off quick on that side, uh, again, getting banged up kind of in the season. And once you, once someone fell on your knee, trying to play through that, that, that doesn't help you out a lot. And, you know, I like the fact that he was able to, you know, be mature enough to stand in there and take some of the calls and some of the questions and some of the, oh, you didn't do as well as you should have done. No, I didn't. I really appreciate it. I really, I'm really doing a lot of work to get better. He's going through all the exercises, he's trying to do all the stuff, the extra stuff this year. He's doing the stuff with the coaches, uh, line coaches and line line schools and stuff, trying to get better. Willie Anderson, the yeah. former Bengal and Raven, did some work with him yeah. uh, during the, the offseason. Teaching him how to get down lower, how to keep stay in his balance and not to be, you know, it's kind of like a, I guess I'd equate it to a golf swing, you know, when you're chipping. If you don't look at the ball, you'll make a big old divot or you'll skull it across the, skull it across the green. But you have to look at it over and over, and you have to take the practice swing over and over, and you have to do it. You have to just be a mechanical moment when you're doing something. That's what he's got to learn to do: be almost mechanical, so he can do that, so he can snap back to a to a position that is always going to be there for him. He's going to do the same thing every time. All right, we got a few more minutes left. Uh, let's go to Rich from Tampa. You're next on the program. Uh, what's up? No, it's Rick. What's up, guys? How you doing? Hi, hey, Rick. Uh, well, I'm glad you're back. I just for some reason to see when you were back and you were there today this morning. Uh, <laughs> we were here yesterday too <laughs> yeah. that's it we're here for the duration now no more time off all right good oh i'm psyched i'm psyched you know and i didn't get a chance to obviously to hear the first part of the show and my first question is is on saquon uh what do you think how that's going to go down he really has no cards to play i don't understand why he wouldn't uh work with the team in this uh, in the position he is, uh, just what, what do you think will happen? What's your gut reaction on that? That was my first question. Uh, second one was, the, uh, what's going to be the the battle for post post position for a position that you're most looking forward to this camp? Um, what are you looking forward to as the best challenge for who's going to uh, make it and that kind of thing? And uh, and also, who's going to be the quarterback for Alabama this year, my man? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> All right, take it in reverse. The, the, Go ahead, Howard. Hey, those first two were easy. That last one, I have no <laughs> idea, man. I mean, they got some good kids down there. I know Saban has, has a plan. He's keeping it tight to the vest. Uh, you had uh, two, yeah. two kids from last year, a redshirt freshman and a true freshman. And you brought the kid in from Notre Dame. So you got three guys that are competing for the job. But, again, I, I believe that he probably is keeping the type to the vest. They got a whole new super crop of receivers that just showed up and, like, I think three incredible running backs that showed up. Of course, your offensive line is always good, but that quarterback is going to be the thing that could be, you know, make or break their season from being a 10-win season and going into the playoffs. Now, yeah, no, I know. I was talking to my Bama guy yet the other day, and he said the same thing. He's like, oh, I don't know who the quarterback's going to be. So I figured I'd ask you since you're the tight. <laughs> yeah, I was, talk- I was talking to somebody down there the other day. They won't even tell you, like, jokingly, like, yeah, it's so good. How are you Giants going to do? I'm like, come on, man. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, they're like, nah, we not tell you. Just, you'll see. Wait the week one. I'm like, yeah, here we go. So that's All right. exciting. You also asked about Barkley, and and I will yeah. tell you, regardless of how this shakes out, multi-year or tag, he will be in the Giants lineup week one against Dallas. I feel very strongly about that. You, okay. you, did he tell you that? He did not tell me that. <laughs> okay. Right. So we got the fanboy over here. So here's what I here's what I think. I think that if whoever is advising Barkley should take a look at the landscape. You got Jacobs mm-hmm. out. You got Jacobs out with the Raiders. You got Cook, who's out there. You you got uh. Elliot, Ellis, Elliot, well, Zeke from uh, Dallas, and a couple other guys that are just out in the market. And Josh Jacobs. Josh Jacobs, yeah, I said Jacobs from Oakland. Right, Maybe did not you? Oakland, I said the Raiders. Tony uh, Pollard. Tony Pollard. Tony Pollard's sign. No, he's tagged. Tagged. Okay, so you got some of the top 
Like runners. Jacobs is. Yeah, yeah. You got some of the top runners. There were even talks at one point that they were going to try to trade Henry out of Tennessee. Mm-hmm. So if I'm looking at it, I know in Saquon's view, Saquon's view would be, hey, I'm a big part of this offense. I make this offense go. The offense doesn't do, do as well as it does without me. Henry could say that. Mm-hmm. Cook could say that. Jacob mm-hmm. could say that. How'd that work out for Cook, by the way? Cook got <laughs> released. And, you know, I, I don't think that's going to happen to Saquon. I don't think he's going to no. get released. But I think he's going to go into this season, play under the tag, uh, hopefully stay super healthy and try to get, right. you know, and build. If he goes in and has another 1,300, 12 or 1,300 yard rushing and almost 1,000 yards receiving, like, he he may not be a giant the following year because they'll have to pay him too much. I mean, that's going to be – Well, they could tag him a second year in a row, huh? Well, yeah, that's They could true. do that too. And then he'll make a lot more money then. But that's kind of mm-hmm. what he's going to have to do to figure it out. I mean, he's – the long-term commitment for backs, the league is just – just they've just totally shifted. They don't believe in it anymore. Uh, I don't know why, but it seems like there's a great back coming out every year out of college or two or three or four. But, you know, you hope to get guys like Saquon that can last forever. But we're mm-hmm. just gonna we're gonna see what he has to do. All right. Now, in terms of positions, you know, to me, I'm intrigued by the receiver spot because there are so many guys in the room now. Okay. I'm very intrigued by who they wind up keeping on the 53 because I do think that Robinson and Shepard. You have to be realistic. They might both start week one on pup. That is possible. So that will change the dynamic of who they keep at wide receiver. So that's a very interesting position. But in terms of concern, you want to make sure that this offensive line is going to be upgraded. So if John Michael Schmitz is ready right away to start week one, that would be awesome. You hope that's the case. You hope Joshua Azudu uh, wins the job at left guard. And you hope that Evan Neal is fully healthy and ready to go at right tackle. And that the line from the very first game against the Cowboys is hitting on all cylinders. That's certainly something that you got to be looking for. And then the other thing for me that I'm looking forward to seeing as well is up the middle defensively. We know they added a couple of defensive tackles in Nacho and Robinson. They added Okereke at middle linebacker. And they got a situation at safety where we're not 100% sure who the starting safety is going to be. And up the middle, you know when you're trying to get that rush defense going, mm-hmm. Howard, you got to be strong up the middle. Yeah. So I'm curious to how that's going to shake out, and that 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 would be my answer. Yeah, I think okay. the, the most, the probably most competitive spots is going to be the interior offensive line, the two guards, uh, who whoever's going to make the spot right and left. I think that I know everyone says that we got one side picked already, but I'm not really sure. There's going to be a competition all the way across the board and interiorly. Uh, I think the other thing that I'm probably most curious about is, like, I love Trayvon Thibodeau. I want Trayvon to have over, you know, a double-digit sack season. But we need somebody to be able to play an equal amount of plays on his opposite side. And I know we, we got uh, – Aziz Ojolari. We got Ojolari, but – Missed a lot of games. He, he's, on a, he's on a pitch count. So I'm wondering which one of these other guys that we have that's going to be able to step up and be that other guy – you know, when, when Ojolari can't play. When, like, okay, if Ojolari goes two games in a row, it's kind of like on a basketball thing. He can't play three or four. Can we bring one of those guys up? Can one of those guys be the guy that's going to be equally, if it's like Zimenez or whoever it's going to be, can be equally as dangerous dangerous, and, and can, you know, be productive. And so guys, they're like, okay, well, we can, you know, scheme things towards this guy. We know he won't be in the game this week. So I'm, that's what I'm interested in to see. Yeah, Fox is part yeah. of that equation. We saw him uh, yeah. play some last year as an undrafted rookie free agent, and he, and he did some good things. And Johnson, right? Oh, right. He's still you, there? You, you Johnson. Got one no, I'm going to get the wrong guy. Yeah. Or uh, might have been John, but said uh, a couple weeks back is that you're not necessarily just looking at the, uh, the new guys coming in, but the second-year guys. Yeah, that's something that Lance back. loves to talk about, and he's Thanks. actually right. Your second and yeah. third year guys have to take that next step yeah. and become yeah. very yeah. significant yeah. players, even more so than the rookie class. Yeah, the second year yeah. guys get the most knowledge of, of the NFL, so they do make the biggest jump right away. Uh, they right. Keep, hopefully they keep getting better, but they make the biggest jump in the second year because at that second year is when they've seen everything, they've kind of got the routine down, and now they, they've kind of seen the, the action and the ability of the players they're going to be playing against. So it kind of makes them pick up a little bit. You know, guys like yeah. McKinney, 
yeah. uh, who's been around a while, but you want him to really have a Pro Bowl season. Neil. You, know, Neil, you want Neil to, to pick it up. You want Azudu to pick it up. Mm-hmm. These are all guys. You, you want Thibodeau to, to become yeah. an impact player every week, not just a few yeah. games. You know, you, you want Ojolari to stay on the field. These are all young guys. These are not rookies we're yeah. talking about. Yeah. These are young guys who have to become consistent core players. And this is the year for them to do it. Evan, yep. you know, consistency. And Trayvon, I'm like, I agree, Howard, 100%. He's that he's. I'm a, this is this is a big year for him to break out and be the guy that we want. The, the good news about Kayvon Thibodeau is that after he got rid of that knee brace, he started to look a lot more like the Giants wanted him to look. Yeah. I keep the telling, that, yeah, I keep telling everybody that he got injured in the preseason. Mm-hmm. That injury and, and then putting that knee brace on slowed everything down. He sure did. Him. And then the moment he started to get better and gets the knee brace off, Ojolari comes back and he's like sprinting off the ball. Like, Tibbet was like, "Oh, I can do that too." <laughs> and it just look, he just looked different. Those two guys could be a real dynamic duo. If you can get them healthy, that'd yeah. be that'd be special. Yep. All right, very good. Thank guys. you, Rick. Well, glad you're back. Glad you're back. Appreciate All it. Right. We're glad to be back. That'll do it for today's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live. We thank you so much for joining us. And, of course, if uh, you don't listen to the program live, you can always catch it on the uh, Giants Podcast Network going through the archive. Go to the Apple Podcasts and all your favorite podcast platforms and check us out. Uh, Put the number down, 201-939-4513. We are here Monday to Friday live from 12.30 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time to talk New York Giants football Uh, Howard Cross, always good to see you, man. Always good to be seen. For Howard, I'm Paul Dottino. We'll see you next time.